So, you've been assigned to teach public speaking. It's not essay writing, and it's not theater. We want to make the experience as beneficial for our students as possible. We want them to leave our classroom empowered, inspired, and confident in their skill sets. But who has the time to read research and go to workshops? That's where I come in. My name is Julian, and you're listening to the Public Speaking Educators Forum. This podcast is for educators who teach public speaking. Each week, you'll hear from a fellow instructor who has an interesting trick to the trade to share with you. We are speaking up so that you can help your students to speak up too. Tonight on the forum, we'll be talking to Professor John Saltes, who is an assistant professor of communication at County College of Morris in New Jersey and the co-chair of The Legacy Project, which is a public lecture series offered to the college community. Professor Saltes, welcome to the forum. So to begin, could you tell us a little bit about The Legacy Project and how it got started? Absolutely, and thank you for the time today. The Legacy Project at County College of Morris has been around for almost a decade at this point. It's an annual showcase of many different voices. Uh, These voices are presented to us in in different ways, um, traditional lectures, sometimes book readings, even performances. And we have a whole year programming that goes from the fall into the spring on a variety of different topics. It began in fall of 2013 with a sold out event honoring the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Myself plus other faculty members at CCM really felt that it was important to remember and honor that anniversary of that speech. So what we did is we reached out to some community leaders, in particular civil rights leader Theodora Smiley Lacey, who is an important figure in New Jersey history and she was also a personal friend of Dr. King's. We invited her plus other um, civil rights leaders, other community leaders to campus for a panel discussion on this 50th anniversary. And we were met with great success. Not only was the event very engaging, but it also sold out. We sadly had to turn away people at the door. So we knew we had something here. So we decided to continue the next semester We continued with a a look at the beat generation, and in particular, um, the role that women played in this 1950s literary scene. So we invited um, two very prolific writers, Joyce Johnson and Hetty Jones to campus. And again, we were surprised by not only just how engaging and wonderful the content was, but how many people showed up and were really yearning for these academic lessons in a slightly different format than a traditional classroom setting. And since then, we've just continued to build and build. Um, We very quickly turned into a series of events that were built around a common topic. So our signature series is really um, two to four events per year built around one topic. And we've had topics um, that were pretty varied. We um, just finished um, a year, actually two years on the topic of war, peace and healing. We've also examined um, the very serious topic of genocide. We've also looked at many different cultures and we've had many different voices throughout the years. And we've continually expanded. Um, Now today, we're not just that signature series, which are those kind of important lectures that we present for the entire campus community. Now we have something called the Ambassadors Program that my colleagues have kickstarted, which allows individual professors to invite guests right into their classroom, typically through Zoom or some other um, virtual platform. But this is not like the large campus event. This is a much more intimate event, and it ties in specifically to a faculty member's curriculum. We also have a summer institute where we do some professional development with faculty members. Um, We bring them together in the summer, hopefully to kind of uh, learn about a topic so that they might be able to bring those lessons to their classroom. We're going to kick that off next year. We also are welcoming in new members to the Legacy Project. Um, CCM has um, something called the Commemoration Committee, a very important initiative 
started by one of my colleagues, and that is now going to be part of the Legacy Project. And we're really thankful to welcome them in. And finally, we, we, we're just kickstarting another one called uh, Curriculum Connections that looks at our near nearly a decade of programming kind of as a library of resources so future faculty members can use our resources, whether they be videos of our past presentations or books that we have now in a library setting of past speakers, and they can use those resources with their students to bring curricular examples to their classroom. So the Legacy Project started off as this very small idea, and it has now grown into a really, um, really enriching a year of programming with many different facets. That's really interesting, John. Now, getting such a large project, such as a lecture series, going certainly requires support from administration. In the case of the Legacy Project, how did you get the college to buy into the project? So. Um, from the beginning, we definitely realized that we needed to have buy-in from our administration, and I would also expand that to include the community as well. We wanted the Legacy Project to be for our students, for our faculty, for our staff, for our administration, and for those local residents in the, in the area, in Morris County. We were very um, lucky, I believe, because we had a dean of liberal arts at the time who was our main point of contact with the administration. And when we pitched him on the idea, specifically about the program that honored the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's speech, he was immediately into the idea, and he was able to provide some funding for us so that we could make that event a reality. Because I do think that at the higher education level, when you do community events and programming, it's necessary to have some type of, of basic foundation of funding and budgeting. It doesn't have to be a lot of uh, money, but it does have to be something because you have to build from some, some starting point. And we were very lucky that we were housed within the School of Liberal Arts at CCM. We also invited our administration, and I think that's a key, um, key part of this is to have administration and faculty and staff in the room so that they can be inspired just as much as students and community members. So we had our Dean of Liberal Arts in the room. We had our Vice President of Academic Affairs in the room. And they were impressed. I can I can definitely say that they, they walked away really impressed by the engagement of the content, but also I think again that there were so many students, so many community members in the room outside of class time, not necessarily there because they were required to be. And with that, it kind of became this it kind of um, unstoppable roller coaster where we just kept adding more events and programs because we kept succeeding. Um, we were able to get more money the next semester. And then by the second year, we were able to have an annual budget, which really helped us because it gave us a sense of permanence. It also gave us really from the practical side, something to start with every summer as we began realizing whatever our dreams were for the upcoming academic year. There's a lot that goes into contracting of speakers, um, booking the rooms, because we're not only at our campus at CCM, we've also had community events. We've uh, rented out a theater at the Morris Museum. We've rented out library spaces. We also have um, contracted with a dance company and we had to rent out our own theater at CCM and have a full on arts performance. We have had so many different needs for budgeting and, and for finances that it really helps that we now are considered an annual budget item because that gives us something that we can expect so that when the dreamers who are our advisors, our faculty advisors, when they get into a room and they're really trying to dream and plan for one year to two years out, they can bank on some of that funding. I also will say that we needed to um, grow the project with external funding as well. And we've been very thankful to partner with um, the New Jersey Council for the Humanities as one example of getting external grant funding to help us. They were able to underwrite us for the years focused on war, peace, and healing. And that really then took us to a whole new level where um, in the 2020-2021 academic year, we were able to present almost 20 virtual events during a pandemic on Zoom. All of them just remarkable, really engaging um, material. And that was in large part thanks to that grant and that funding. So yeah, the, the practicality of pulling this all together is that 
administrative buy-in is important and I, m my recommendation to other educators is try to move your college try to move the culture at your college towards a sense of permanence where it's not simply project to project funding but that you establish a good enough reputation that you use your funds wisely that every year you have a bankable kind of starting off point from a budgetary perspective and then you can grow from there and then secondly you need a team and we have a great team there's 35 people with the legacy project we have a team that is always chasing grant dollars and that is just a necessary reality for higher education nowadays we need to be looking for dollars we need to be using those dollars and um, we're going to continue to do that so yeah those are two things that are pretty important absolutely and that is wonderful to hear that your administration has been so supportive of this initiative right from the beginning and even more that your faculty are so involved now over the years how has this series grown or evolved so when we began the legacy project we didn't really know where it was headed but we we knew we had something special here but very quickly i would say probably by year two or three we started to focus in on a couple of important internal goals one of them was context the idea that when someone comes to our events they are able to contextualize them and connect what the speaker is saying to their real lives whether personal or professional lives that has always been the case and continues to this day community another one that was really important to us we wanted to go beyond the realm of our community at ccm and really get into morris county and even wider to new jersey but one that I would like to focus on is curriculum. And this kind of leads into the subdivisions that are underneath the legacy project umbrella. Curriculum is something that we always kind of were very close to because we're all faculty members, but it was kind of um, a secondary thought. We didn't know how to fit these speakers, these topics into individual classes. And then we had a bit of an aha moment um, about a year or two ago. It was during the pandemic and we were you know we needed to adapt we needed to have virtual zoom based programming because we couldn't be in person and we also had grant money we also had internal money and we really wanted to use that money we didn't want to stop the legacy project simply because everything was um, really much more difficult during the pandemic so team members that i work with um, fellow co-chairs developed a project known as the legacy project ambassadors program it's a great program. It launched in fall 2020. And what this program does is it allows individual faculty members the chance to host speakers as an extension of their curriculum. And the wider community is still invited to attend. So for example, um, a faculty member who is teaching game design, teaching business, teaching my discipline of journalism, teaching history, teaching in the sciences like biology class, they're able to apply a very simple application to our ambassadors program um, team members. They apply essentially with a pitch for a speaker that they would like us to fund to come and speak within their class uh, during the pandemic. This was, of course, on a Zoom call. And we took a look at it and we evaluated the speakers. We looked at the potential for an audience. We looked at the different topics that were being proposed. And we were able to get a lot of applications in and we were able to fund these speakers to come and speak to the students within that class. And beyond that, what we did require was that that class with that individual faculty member could be opened up to whoever wanted to join them, which really gives a great opportunity for both members of the CCM community, but members who are not college students to come in and kind of get the, the feel, the flavor of what a college class is like with this really dynamic guest speaker. We didn't know if it was gonna work, but it absolutely worked. We had a lot of applications come in and we really did have a great number of speakers and they were really all different types of um, topics that were being um, looked at. I remember one of the best ones uh, one of my um, uh, colleagues and friends, Professor Samantha Gigliotti, in the bio, biology and chemistry department. She's a co-chair of the Legacy Project, and she brought in an expert on invasive species in New Jersey. And because of just how great the speaker was and how interesting the topic was, we were able to get more than 100 people on a, on a Zoom call 
and it was just a dynamic one hour of programming for whoever wanted to join. It worked really well for her class and it worked equally as well for the community at large. And we did this in a number of different ways. I, I also um, pitched um, um, having a speaker who was a journalist come in, uh, Sierra Crane Murdoch was her name, and she has a, a, a tremendously powerful book um, that, that came out called um, Yellow Bird. And this was a, a really great speaker to have, a, an important topic to talk about. And it not only helped my journalism students who are learning sort of similar journalism mechanics and techniques, but it also was just a, an important story to hear if you were from the community at large. So we welcomed um, uh, Sierra Crane Murdoch in as well, all part of this ambassadors program. And that's really what legacy is today. It's not just the legacy project. It is these other um, committees and programs like the commemoration committee, like the Summer Institute, which will officially launch in June of 2022. And then curriculum connections, this, this library of resources. So we really have a lot of um, awesome different um, content and subdivisions in our project. It definitely sounds like you're doing some wonderful things with this project. So do you have any advice for those faculty members who are interested in putting together a lecture series on their own campuses? So in order to do this maybe at your own college campus, um, it's definitely doable. We have not done anything that we think is just unique to CCM. It can be modeled out at any community college, at any four-year university. What I would say is a key element that should be established before you kind of start with the programming is you have to recognize that if you have one person yourself or a small team of people, let's say um, some co-chairs or co-directors, um, that's, that's a good start, but you're gonna need an advisory committee. You need as many different voices as possible to help drive the direction of your project, of whatever it might be, because no one has like all of the answers. So you need to have many different disciplines represented. So the Legacy Project has something called the LPAC, the Legacy Project Advisory Committee. It's made up of five um, of the co-directors, co-chairs, plus 30 advisors. And these 35 people all have an equal vote when it comes to major decisions on programming, like topics, and even speakers. We do presentations for the advisory committee four times a year. We take votes, we tally those votes. We make our future, our direction for the future, all based on kind of the idea of democracy within this diverse group of advisors. And I think that's really led to our success. You know, there's always going to be the less than glamorous side of doing programming or a, a speaker's series or an institute. There's going to have to be a lot of paperwork, a lot of renting of rooms, a lot of budgeting and financing, meeting with the, you know, um, the community, meeting with the administration, meeting with students. All of that can be done by a small team of, let's say, co-directors or co-chairs. But really, the, the content, the programming that is the, the most important part that should come from an advisory committee. So we're, I'm very thankful that we have the LPAC. Um, and I'm also thankful that the people who have joined it really have contributed a lot of their time. And also I would say that they stick around for a while, which is great. You know, we don't actually have, um, we have like kind of like an entrance, um, but we don't necessarily have an exit. We let people kind of live and breathe in their academic life. And when they stay with us, they usually stay with us for a long time, which is great because they're having a lot of fun. They're getting a lot out of it. And I think they're also feeling like they're heard and they're seen because their votes, their debates, their conversations about topics and in which direction we should go is really based on their feedback. So um, there's a lot that goes into it. I'll give you, for instance, we usually work about two years in advance because of the level of contracting that we have to do and um, the many different speakers that we have to reach out to. So for this academic year, 2021, 2022, we're still kind of in this pandemic and we're still trying to figure out in-person versus Zoom, but we already have our topic for next year selected and we already have the topic for the year after that selected. We've already met as far as committees, we've already looked at speakers, we've already started to vote. So there's already something kind of going on because this structure is here. This, this um, Legacy Project Advisory Committee is able to stay on task and really consider what 
is coming in the future. And if we didn't have that, if we didn't have like that group of dreamers, the group of people who are looking towards the future, there's no really way that we could sustain ourselves. So the co-directors, the co-chairs, um, we do the day to day and the advisory committee, which is crucial for your college if you wanna do this, they're the ones that look at the long-term plans. And if you bring those two together, a solid group of people who do the short-term and then a, a larger group of advisors who do the long-term, that probably should lead to some success, absolutely. Well, thank you, John, for all of your advice and my hat off to you and your colleagues for putting together such an excellent initiative. And of course, Thank you all for listening to this week's edition of the Public Speaking Educators Forum. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and Google Play. Follow us on Twitter at PSEF Podcast. And be sure to tune in again real soon.